Alrighty, hello everyone. Welcome to the Jordan B. Peterson community. Uh, with this in this study group session, we're going to be doing twelve rules of life. Now, each Saturday we do a discussion as part of the Jordan B. Peterson study group, where you can engage in discussions about Peterson's lectures. We've done the maps of meaning twice. We've done personality once, and we're we've got one Bible lecture left to do. And after that, it's going to be an open discussion about what we're going to discuss in these weekly Saturday meetings. Now, on Sunday, we do these recorded sessions because the Saturday meetings are completely private and confidential, so people are free to express without government tyranny or employer tyranny. And uh, then these Sunday ones, we try and wrap it up to be a bit more formulated, uh, where the people who don't have to worry about those things can actually discuss. Uh, now, on the last week of every second month, the study group becomes a reading group instead, where we discuss one of Peterson's recommended texts. So that's what's happening uh, this week, uh, which is we're now discussing Peterson's book, 12 Rules of Poor Life. Uh, and that's it. Uh, you can find all the details at jordanbpeterson.community. That is uh, instead of .com, .community. So without... Uh, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, I'm joined here today with Sumit uh, from India, and I'm Ben from currently Kuala Lumpur. So uh, we'll be working through 12 Rules of Life. We uh, the discussion we had one the previous uh, the earlier Saturday one. There were some issues with it not happening, but then the evening one went on for a few hours, and we worked through most of the rules and had some. It was quite valuable, so let me share my screen quickly and we will see what we ended up coming up with uh, as soon as I figure out how I share my screen. All right, there we go. Present to everyone. So here we go. So this is our great Jordan B study group uh, document. Get all of this at Jordan B. Peterson Community. So, right there on the study group. So, and then this one is 12 Rules for Life. So, these are the notes we took away. So, let's, uh, let's go over them. So, rule one stand up straight with the shoulders back. So, it seemed for this, we're trying to figure out like an action plan. And on the forum, where you've got a topic now, whoop, wrong forum. Discuss. Jordan B. Peterson. So let's go up. So this is the forum which we're using to discuss the text as well as like the book. So we've got this action plan uh, topic where we're going to try and figure out what the actual actions are from each chapter we can take and then what the benefits of those actions are meant to be. So if you want to then you know, if you're reading the book and want to just get the actions, then, you know, try and help participate in this effort because we've still got more chapters to do. And maybe, you know, at the end we can consolidate this into a nice little thing. So, you know, you can just, you know, hang up this little action list on your wall. Uh, and there was a document like that which was like how to be exceptional that I hanged up on my toilet doll. So every time I was shitting a few years ago, then uh, I read this how to be exceptional thing and it, it kind of really helped. So uh, hopefully we can do the same thing for this. So we've, we were trying to go through all the rules, just talk about things that we found interesting, see whether we can test them further to see whether or not they would survive testing as well as just come up with some practical actions. But it was mostly focused on rule six, rule seven, rule eight, the discussion was. So maybe we'll have some more discussions about this in a few weeks, but at least this is where we are. So rule one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Never be the person making a decision out of weakness. Because standing up straight with your shoulders back, uh, Peterson was criticized, uh, I think it was in the Australian interview he discussed this. And uh, the interviewer asked Peterson whether or not, let me uh, go back to my pretty face, uh, uh, the interview asked Peterson, well, isn't that about dominance and about aggression, like standing up straight with your shoulders back? And he's like, it's not about aggression at all because uh, when you're standing up straight with your shoulders back, you're actually exposing your belly, which is all your vital organs. So it's the same thing when you go for a hug. 
uh, when you're going for a hug, it's exposing, I am comfortable to be vulnerable around you. Uh, that's why it works so well for oxytocin release, like the bonding hormone. Uh, because if you're going to hug the wrong person, then you're going to get stabbed and it's all game over. So the hugging is a sign of I'm willing to be vulnerable around you. And that's why it works for bonding. So standing up straight with the shoulders back is as well, it's a sign of strength um, and of character. So if you do that, then it's more about you're approaching the world as if you're strong. And we'll see this with the action plan thing. So he says, for rule one, so attend carefully to your posture. Quit drooping and hunching around. Speak your mind. Put your desires forward as if you had a right to them. At least the same right as others. Walk tall and gaze forthrightly ahead. Dare to be dangerous. Encourage the serotonin to flow plentifully through the neural pathways, desperate for its calming influence. So what's the benefit? People, including yourself, will start to assume that you are confident and able or at least they will not immediately conclude the reverse. Emboldened by the positive expenses you are now receiving, you will begin to be less anxious. Let me just actually go back to sharing, because it's probably better if I'm reading text for it to be visible. Ah, shit. You will then find it easier to pay attention to the sub subtle <laughs> social clues that people exchange when they are communi communicating. Your conversations will flow better with fewer awkward pauses. This will make you more likely to meet people, interact with them, and impress them. Doing so will not only generally increase the probability that good things will happen to you, it will also make those good things feel better when they do happen. Thus strengthened and emboldened, you may choose to embrace being and work for its furtherance and improvement. Thus strengthened, you may be able to stand even during the illness of a loved one, even during the death of a parent, and allow others to find strength alongside you when they would otherwise be overwhelmed with despair. Thus emboldened, you will embark on a voyage of your life. Let your light shine, so to speak, on their heavenly hill and pursue your rightful destiny. Then the meaning of your life may be sufficient to keep the corrupting influence of mortal despair at bay. Then you may be able to accept the terrible burden of the world and find joy. So that's rule one. And I think about this in terms of, well, maybe it's also just, well, if you're a knight and you're going to conquer the dragon, uh, first you need courage. And you can wear that courage through your armor. So the armor actually embodies the courage that, you know, you should be strong because if, you, <laughs> if you're a knight who's terrified and, and his knees wobble when he sees dragon, then the armor's not going to do any good. Uh, so you still need to uh, have the pose of confidence. And you think about this as well, like if you uh, were to sit down, uh, like there's the idea of... Uh, you have your biology, your psychology, and then your narrative. And they all influence each other. So if you change two of them, then it'll generally change the other one. So if you can change your biology as well as your psychology, uh, then it will change the narrative. But if you change the narrative and the psychology, it can change the biology. But some biology markers are really strong. So if you sit, uh, what was it, like head in their hands like that, for a while, then you're going to get upset because it's an arch archetypical pose of being upset. Uh, it's actually not a good pose. So that will actually start making you think what, you know, sad thoughts, and then that will start creating a sad narrative. So it would make sense then, you know, standing up straight. Like another one is if you want to be happy, uh, you know, you can put your hands back all the way, smart, uh, ceiling. Uh, and do that for five minutes, like the biggest smile you can. And it's even better, it's like the mountain pose, I think, uh, in yoga. So if you do that, uh, but you're smiling at the, you know, the ceiling or the heavens or whatever you want, then it's like the ultimate uh, pose of openness and strength uh, and also bliss kind of thing. So then it forces happiness uh, upon you. So, uh, all right, let's go into, 
back in. Rule two, treat yourself like someone you're responsible. So the story he, I think, he, he mostly talked about this one was his buddy Chris. Uh, and one of the actions we came up with for how to facilitate this is journaling. Now, what's interesting is uh, I, I listened to the audiobook of 12 Rules for Life. Uh, so, and it was Peterson narrating the audiobook. So, on a few chapters, he actually cried during the audiobook reading. Uh, he got quite impassioned, I, I think is the word. And yeah, it, it was quite touching and quite moving. Uh, so, he did it with talking about uh, Chris as well as talking about his daughter and a, f a few times in the book, especially like the truth chapter, like the end of the truth chapter. Um, he got quite emotional. So it's quite a treat if you get the audiobook. Rule three, make friends with people who want the best for you. <laughs> John read out a great quote from the book here, and he, <laughs> he hasn't put it in. Rule four, compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Again, journaling is a great way of facilitating this. And speaking of which, if we go to ba 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 to the forum, I've added in here two books that aren't a Peterson recommended text, but they're also some of the foundation. Well, the Think and Grow Rich is one of the foundational books of per the personal development scene. So I've been attached here the self analysis questions from Think and Grow Rich. Uh, they're from the chapter, How to Outwit the Six Ghosts of Fear. Now, Thick and Grow Rich is, uh, Napoleon here was commissioned by Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie is one of the richest people who ever lived, who spent his first third of his life uh, learning, second third of his life implementing, and third third of his life giving everything away. He's also, uh, his legacy is also what's causing the $1 salaries and also the pledges to cause... Uh, all the millionaires to try and give away all the wealth. Uh, he kind of started that, but he commissioned Napoleon Hill to spend his entire life to try and find out what made successful people successful. So the Think and Grow Rich is all about, out of you know, considering everything, uh, what were the traits that made people successful, and then the book is all about that. So these self-analysis questions is a way of using introspection to try and you know change your mind into finding out what are the what is the battleground of your mind currently looking like and then where are the weeds and how we can pull those weeds out. Now I'm also working through his book Your Right to Be Rich uh, and in it he's got these other self-assessments. This is one of them. There's going to be another one uh, in the next chapter. So these are also ways of rating yourself and uh, so Another tool to, uh, to help facilitate that. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Now, for that, uh, for myself, uh, the big issue I had was, uh, one of the issues I had in my life was I would compare myself to like Elon Musk or Zuckerberg. I had the idea of like, yeah, I'm going to be uh, the youngest billionaire. And then as my age starts ticking away closer and closer to, to Zuckerberg, uh, then it started really making me quite upset. Uh, and it's the same thing, like I would compare myself to like the best of the industry because I wanted to replicate the success or even exceed the success. But then the thing is, is then certain things in my life really uh, prevented uh, those things. Like I had some, like a lot of family issues, things like that, that had to be dealt with. So those things took control. And also, people are just temperamentally, like not everyone can be like the best person in the world. And you generally have to accept, yeah, like, you know, part of reducing the narcissism of the modern world is to realize not everyone can be, do, have everything that they want because not everyone has the capability to do that or the incentive or the drive or the, yeah, or the ability. Like they just don't have the ability. Maybe they're not actually that high in conscientiousness and, and uh, intelligence, like openness, um, to be able to do be highly successful in a complex world. Uh, maybe they have to then align with the industry that is then facilitating of who they actually are, rather than trying to align, like fit themselves in a jigsaw puzzle that doesn't have a piece for them. 
<sighs> Who was this punk that just vandalized this document? Uh, <laughs> so let's go back to uh, here. It was uh, Suvit, you punk. All right. Uh, so rule four. The other one, uh, John raised this one, which is using Lego towers for accomplished tasks to resemble the city you have built with your actions. Should you tear parts out, which you... Ah, then that was the question afterwards. Should you tear parts out when you did bad? So the idea here is like a way of trying to visualize your success. Uh, so if we then... Well, let me just make sure I'm presenting to everyone. Uh, so yeah, as you're doing a to-do list, like it's an arbitrary thing, like a paper to-do list is better because you actually get the sensation of crossing something off in the real world, like interacting with the real world. Because if you're just doing digital stuff, you're just interacting with your mind. And there's nothing real world about that. Uh, it's not as uh, sensational <laughs> as using a pen and paper or even actually seeing uh, your manifestation be able to mold itself in your hands like traditional woodwork. Um, or even farming and things like that, or, or yeah, the, the blue collar jobs. So the thing is, is that with white collar, then having a way of visualizing that is actually really cool. So John uh, raised the thing of, well, have all your, like create a little map and then write down your little tasks uh, on the little, you know, map or whatever, and then put a uh, Lego block as you complete the tasks and things. So that way at the end you have this big city that you created. And I think that's really cool. Um, maybe that can be gamified. I know the Pomodoro app Forest does it with trees, but then again, uh, it doesn't actually show you like a city. It just shows you like the little wheat and you can plant some trees, but it's just like, again, it's just a digital thing. I think it would be pretty cool to have like a, uh, a physical thing. Uh, because otherwise you, but then again, you can just use these like self-analysis questions to then be able to compare yourself adequately with the past to then actually be able to have the gratefulness to actually realize your progression. Um, but then being able to see it would also be good. But then I also wonder, well, if you've had a shit day and then you've actually made tomorrow worse, then should you pull some blocks out? Um, but maybe not. Maybe you should just put in a deformed looking block or something like that. Color it a different color. So rule five, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. We didn't get to that rule. Rule six, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Apparently for this one, Peterson got some slack because they said, well, no one has their house in perfect. Like no one's home is perfect. Uh, no one has been able to get their situation perfect. However, uh, it's not about getting it perfect. It's about getting it in perfect order. So perfect order does not equal perfect uh, because perfect means without problems. It just means ordered problems. So for instance, in rule, rule 12, Peterson and his wife would stop fighting in disorder. Uh, so when they were having an argument, and it could even be like an existential argument, like a serious argument, uh, they would end up, and if that argument then proceeded into disorder, uh, they started getting a bit heated, then they would have a break for a day, they would sleep in separate rooms, and they would spend some time thinking about what they did to contribute to the disorder. Then, as well, Peterson talks about dealing with his daughter, which had early onset arthritis. They set aside time each day to, keep, to deal with that issue, so an hour each day to deal with uh, the daughter's condition. Uh, and then that allowed them to actually keep battling everything because otherwise that issue could take control of everything. And it would be like the little dragon that got so big that you couldn't deal with it anymore. But then, uh, so then if you, that dragon becomes so big, then the little, all the other dragons that were little that you were dealing with adequately, then will be able to uh, knock you out. Uh, or maybe it's just that... Uh, it's not that the dragon got so big, it's more that all your efforts went towards one dragon so then the other dragons could sneak behind your back and eat you or stab you or whatever it is dragons do. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, it seems like you need to keep your eye on the ball. So, 
psych, uh, and he talked about the psychological effects of setting aside the time to deal with the issue. Now, I'm not sure how true that is because some foundational issues, they kind of be beckoned to be dealt with urgently. Uh, but then again, uh, one of the rules I've had is don't discuss anything with me that will that requires emotions until after I've done my work. Because otherwise, it's just like, well, now my unconscious has been seized and I can't work anymore uh, for that day. My mind is elsewhere. And, that, and I think Peterson talks about it that in the book as well somewhere, which is, you know, the girlfriend that then sends like a loaded text message to the guy, or maybe it was a Stefan Molyneux clip, like, you know, is, is, yeah, it was the Stefan Molyneux one, uh, that sends a little, you know, existential text message to the uh, guy when he's working. It's just like, good luck trying to work. Your, your head's going to be elsewhere. Like, deal with it adequately at an appropriate time. Uh, so that's a lot different than having it perfect. It's just have it in order. Same thing for a business, right? Like put your business in order so it can actually tackle its problems and yeah, tackle the world. So how could I be the problem with my family and the world? Don't preach what you can't practice. Uh, so this would be, so it would be hypocritical for Martin Luther King to give marriage advice, but he didn't. He gave like treatment about how to deal with races uh, or racial advice. So, <laughs> so that's the uh, other factor here about, yeah, set yourself. And so it's kind of like uh, the Jesus quote, which is, um, uh, you know, he who wishes to throw the first stone, see whether or not he's innocent first or something like that. So it's like, is there any reason to throw a stone at yourself first? Uh, and generally there is. Uh, because you could always be better. Uh, so you shouldn't be trying to uh, preach something that you can't even practice. And there was the idea, I'm not sure which part it was. Um, uh, it was here in Rule 7. So there's the idea of, we we're talking, I was talking about relationship advice with somebody and one of the things we came up with was never get relationship advice from someone who's had a shorter, like, you know, if you're wanting, if you're in a long-term relationship, um, don't get relationship advice from people who've never had a long-term relationship, because they have no fucking clue what they're talking about. It's like that clip between Steven Crowder and the uh, the blonde bimbo comedian. Uh, I can't even remember her name, but I think everyone would know the comedian that I'm talking about. Um, so Steven Crowder and her, uh, she's then saying, uh, uh, Stephen Crowder's got the case, it's a debate, and then it's uh, whether or not you should have sex uh, before and after, before or after you're married, and then whether or not that promotes relationship success. And then all the stats, like if you then YouTube uh, Stephen Molyneux, uh, the truth about sex, the, the data aligns with having sex after marriage is one of the best things you can do to guarantee your marriage will last or your relationship will last. Um, and in that clip, uh, Stefan speculates about it. So first hour is data and then the last hour or so is interpretation. But the data aligns with that. And then uh, the bimbo was then saying, well, I've had, uh, I've had, I, yeah, I, she's like, well, I have sex all the time with people. And like, I've had sex even on the first date. And uh, I've had, you know, long-term relationships. Uh, and then Stefan uh, Crowder was just like, well, the problem with that, and then he's like, how long was the longest one? And the other one was like five years. And Stefan laughs because it's just like, five years is in a bloody long-term relationship when you're talking about marriage. <laughs> like marriage is a life thing. So, <laughs> and the other thing is just like, the other issue there is there was multiple relationships, right? Because if you just have... Uh, the, if the success goes towards just having one, uh, the first one being the one that actually gets you over the roller coaster, and then and then a smooth sailing after that, like after you go over the pit of the roller coaster, um, because you actually experience all the joys of that uh, roller coaster with someone else, then it strengthened it. When if you are, have had multiple partners, you become more fragmented, and you have the options of other people. Now there was a, a discussion that was primarily led by me. Uh, uh, but there was, uh, it was asked and then some, some 
uh, analogies were put out, which what it was interesting, it's not so much related to a rule, but then there was the idea of, well, actually, no, I, I'll save that. It's not particularly important to 12 rules for life, <laughs> as, as funny as it is. You got to participate in the uh, Saturday discussions if you want the, uh, the, the juicy, funny bits. All right, uh, don't preach what you uh, can't practice. So it would be hypocrite. Yeah, communist leaders expect the world to be more selfless than they are. If they were that selfless, they probably wouldn't be communists. <laughs> so I think that one speaks for itself if you're, uh, yeah. All right, the 80 20 rule. So what is the 20% of things that you're doing that is uh, contributing to 80% of the, uh, the shit stuff that's happening in your life? Fix that 20% and your life will get a lot better. Hey, dude. You're, you're going to be on the live stream, but luckily this is not a webcam, so, so I'm going straight to YouTube. Hey, hey. Alrighty, uh, housemate just uh, came in. Alrighty, so the next one, pray to you fix yourself. So there are things that are in our control. And there are th so this apparently was a pray to you episode that was done with Jordan B. Peterson called Fix Yourself. So there are things in our control and there are things that are not in our control. It is vital to figure out what is in which camp and act accordingly. There's no point trying to solve something that isn't in your control. So like relationships and eatable mothers and tyrannical governments, trying to control people as chess pieces rather than units of their own agency. So can't like, uh, I've been reading up a few different books. Uh, there's the one like, you know, on liberty or the concept of liberty says that, uh, has the idea that you should be in control of your person your property and your faculties, I think it was. Uh, let me pull this up. Oh my, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, one moment while I pull this up. Alrighty, so existence, faculties, and assimilation, or in other words, personality, liberty, and property. Okay, personality, liberty, and property. So. And then these are individual rights, and then the idea, so this is the law by Frederick, uh, what's his name? Frederick Bastiat. Uh, so he says, well, you have these individual rights of person, uh, what is it again? Person, liberty, property. So then person is, you know, your own safety. Liberty is then the ability to go out and be successful, so opportunity. Uh, or not even, op yeah, maybe opportunity, but it's more like the idea of agency, right? Like free from oppression, whereas even in suppression and even in repression, those things are due to you not acting against the oppressor. But if, so, oh, <laughs> yeah, in suppression and, uh, and repression, it's more, a, more an insult, I think, about you not acting against the oppressor. When... If you are oppressed, then you're in handcuffs and there's nothing you can do. All you can do is be an example for truth. So, oh, and then the idea was that you can't have a government that, uh, let me share that screen instead, which is the book, bop, 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 uh, that you can't have a government that, if a government violates those rights, uh, violates individual rights. So if the government needs to do something that would be illegal for an individual to do, then it's legal plunder. And there's a Wikipedia page all about legal plunder, which is quite interesting. All right, uh, let's go back to um, the Google Doc. I had a question on that, Ben. Yeah. So this uh, issue of personal uh, liberty or freedom, right? Uh, so. Yeah. I was having this discussion with someone and uh, uh, that person said, uh, I said, I thought that uh, government making it compulsory to stand up for national anthem would be, uh, uh, they're like kind of compelling you to do that. Like they're compelling you to uh, stand up, like that's a physical act. And that could be in violation of you might feel your rights. But then they said, then why do you follow the traffic rules at all? At all? Like, isn't that a violation of your rights? Like, you may not want to follow them. So what's the difference? And uh, I really don't know what to say to that. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, like, let's try and uh, 
battle that out because uh, I would say that traffic rules, I mean, like you can not follow them, but then you're probably going to have an, an accident, like have an accident um, because as everyone else depends on you following those rules. It's, just, it's like the situation in Australia, like the rules are catered towards the lowest common denominator. So it's like you have competent drivers, but they can never express their competency because they are, you know, they have to do what only the lowest common denominator can do. So then they get bored, they check the phones, they uh, tune out, they, you know, and then they do something uh, that then causes an accident. And why does it cause an accident? And it's because everyone else in Australia expects everyone else to follow the rules. There isn't any idea that something unexpected is particularly going to happen. So it's like you expect everyone to also be a good actor and a good player, and then suddenly, for whatever reason, someone isn't, and then it all goes to shit. Uh, when if you're driving in Asia, uh, people are just grossly incompetent with their abilities. And then you also have the foreigners, which are grossly overconfident with their abilities. Uh, so then the overconfident foreigner, they get on the little motorbike and then they drive for about a day. Uh, and then they're like, oh, I got the hang of this. I can figure it all out, just like Australia. And then, you know, so now they're, they're still, you know, driving to what they perceive as their competency and then something unexpected happens and they have no framework for unexpected. And unexpected things are happening on Asian roads all the time. So then bang, they, uh, they end up dying. Uh, so, you know, to be a good driver, it's like, sure, drive at your competency, but you've got to be able to expect the unexpected and then also build up a framework of what the unexpected is. And if you don't yet have that framework, then you shouldn't be driving to the extent of your competency. You should always have a reserve in there for the unexpected. Um, so I think it's like, I mean, like when we talk about uh, government oppression, like if we talk about uh, tax, for instance, like let's say tax to a, a situation, like let's say even education would be outside those things, right? So let's say we're paying tax for a government school, so tax for, you know, free uh, birth control or whatever it is, so tax to, for medical issues or tax for whatever it is, right? Like you can opt to not pay that tax, but then you would go to jail. Um, and can you opt out for not being a citizen of that country? Well, then that would be a problem. Um, so for the national anthem, like for the traffic rules one, you can actually opt out of it, which is uh, like you don't have, like they seem like guidelines, and then as long as you can pay the silly little fines they give you, then it's fine. Um, but then again, it's just like, it's also a system that created, like it seems like that's a system that is set up to protect the person, right? And I think that's probably where it's different because it's rules that are set up to protect the person. And if someone then crashes into you, then you also have like, you would want to be like, what the fuck? And you would want to have that person punished uh, for being negligent, or maybe you were the one. Uh, so it seems like their law is facilitated to protecting the person is like, and also the property because you're also driving a car and you also have the property of your own person. Uh, whereas standing up for a national anthem, uh, I don't understand how this is protecting the property of yourself or of anything or how it's protecting your own liberty because it's forcing you to do something. It's like compelled action. Um, so at least that's my answer. I, I'm not sure whether uh, that was adequate or not. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. That That's a different category of rights because uh, uh, if uh, I stand up against any of the things that government are doing that I think are oppressive, so they can always make this argument that why are you then following any rules at all? Like, why are you then following traffic rules? And to me, that just, you understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you may, uh, Peterson may say, I will not uh, have that compelled speech thing. And they might say, oh, but then, uh, I, I mean, that is just an idiotic argument that like, uh, you, uh, you, but then why do you follow any rules at all, Peterson? Like, why do you follow, uh, follow traffic rules? Uh, I felt like that was a different category of, rights that was being violated i mean like you are re requiring a citizen uh, to stand up for something which uh, it, it's kind of a um, forced propaganda of nationalism being enforced upon you like uh, so to me that was just a different category uh, of uh, uh, rights right 
It's, uh, it's actually quite interesting because uh, in, even in this uh, book he talks about, what's this, let, us, uh, let me just see if I can find this uh, quote, because he talks about it where it's the exact, it's kind of similar to what you just said, which is, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, like, you don't have to be an, an, an anarchist to disagree with one particular instance of a rule. Right, like, like you don't have to throw out the whole baby with the bathwater. Uh, so there's like a thing here which is um, socialist school, uh, socialist things. Okay, ba ba ba. It's true. Is it even in this? Maybe it's actually on his uh, Wikipedia page. Let me see if I can <laughs> pull up this thing because it was it was really quite a ah okay. There we go, it's on the Wikipedia page, let me share that. Alright, so, it's from the law though, it's, uh, it's just later on, I haven't got to that chapter yet. Socialism, like the ancient ideas from which it springs, confuses the distinction between government and society. As a result of this, every time we object to a thing being done by government, the socialists conclude that we object to it being done at all. We disprove of state education, then the socialists say that we oppose to any education. We object to a state religion, then the socialists say that we want no religion at all. We object to a state enforced equality, then they say that we are against equality, and so on and so on. It is as if the socialists were to accuse us of not wanting persons to eat because we do not want the state to raise grain. I do not dispute the right to invent social combinations, to advertise them, to advocate them, and to try upon themselves at their own expense and risk, but I do dispute the right to impose these plans upon us by law, by force, and it compel us to pay for them with our taxes. Uh, so in the book, uh, the law, uh, the point at the beginning, uh, even at the start, is that to as soon as they start to, uh, as soon as the government does anything outside of his person, his liberty and his property, then uh, the government quickly becomes uh, yeah, here, yeah. but so in the law he wrote that everyone has a right to protect his person and his liberty and his property. The state should only be a substitution of common force for individual forces to defend this right. Justice, defense of one's life, liberty and property has precise limits, but if government power extends further into philanthropic endeavors, then government becomes so limitless that it can grow endlessly. The resulting statism is based on triple hypothesis, the total inertness of inertness of mankind, the omnipotence of the law, and the infallibility of the legislator. The public then becomes socially engineered by the legislator, must bend to the legislator's will, like clay to the potter. The state posits, Bastiat, uh, posits that the law becomes perverted when it punishes one's right to self-defense of his life, liberty, and property in favor to, of another's right to legalize plunder which he defines as if the law takes from some persons that belongs to them and gives it to other persons whom it does not belong. See if the law benefits one citizen at the expense of another by doing what the citizen himself cannot do without committing a crime. So I think it's uh, maybe on the legalized plunder page uh, or maybe it's somewhere else that I was reading this. So there's the idea that uh, yeah, I think it kind of sums it up, but it's the it was probably through the actual book where if you um by going outside of just protection of these things, then it needs to there's no way of going outside like if the government wants to do anything but these things, then it ends up imposing and working against these things. If the government is going to go into philanthropic endeavors, then it's going to go against liberty or it's going to do something against these bits because then it's uh, the power that it has influences the freedom of the market. Uh, and then if it influences freedom of the market, then it influences, it affects people's liberty and it can even affect people's property as soon as it becomes uh, socialistic or communistic. It can seize property from one person and then give it to another, be that farms or be it uh, taxes in terms of subsidies. Like, you know, this industry isn't doing too well let steal money from an industry that is doing well and then give it to that or with tariffs uh, then 
you know, let's take money from some people and then try and make things harder for another person. Um, so it actually starts, like there's no way to uh, go into these other things without actually violating those first three. Um, alrighty, uh, let's go back to the study group. Uh, but yeah, what do you think about that submit? Uh, do you think that's adequate? Uh, I like it I how that open was just crickets. <laughs> when you unmuted your microphone, it was just crickets for like 10 seconds. Ah, okay. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, I don't know what to say. Like, I don't like socialism. No. Uh, so, I want people to have maximum freedom and government to have like least amount of uh, this thing. Uh, power that is needed to do whatever it is that they do. Uh, so, so that's wh that's where I always been. Uh, uh, and it's not been an issue of uh, economics or anything else. It's just been an issue of values. Uh, like uh, being left alone. Because uh, you people may have more competent governments, I guess, but uh, at least uh, with me, every, not every, but I can say every, roughly speaking, interaction I have had with government have been the like worst experience uh, ever. Uh, so whenever, uh, whenever they require me to do something that requires me to deal with the government agency, uh, it just they, those people are so incompetent uh, they kind of ruin your whole day. Uh, so uh, uh, it just whenever. Uh, uh, we have this program and it's a really dangerous program i don't think anyone else has it in this whole world uh, uh which is every citizen now have a universal id mm -hmm. and uh, people were like uh, uh, people defended by saying uh, uh, that uh, hey this is just to track down the bad guys or uh, this is just to curb on black money or corruption and uh, stuff like that. This is just to go after the terrorists. And uh, 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 I, I see like how naive people can be. Uh, uh, they treat you like a, you know, some kind of nut job if you stand up and say, this is a really dangerous program, people. They are linking your mobile phones to this. And uh, now it has gone to even the private sector. So they have got this APIs. So uh, the private sector can call. So we had these uh, uh, wallets using which you can transfer money digitally now all of them require that you link the aadhaar card to it uh, so what i'm saying is they they are able to like track everything down uh, with that num number your phone your bank accounts everything and uh, people say yeah that's good uh, what have you to hide you are a good person and they just don't understand what's happening i mean uh, 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 it's 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 scary. What's uh, um, uh, what's what's going on? And uh, uh, the thing is, Ben, I doubt if most people would agree with the you and me on this because uh, whenever the government starts with its programs to help everyone uh, and do good things, uh, uh, I, I doubt if like majority of people would oppose that. They would be like, "Oh, bring it on! It's going to help us." stuff so, so it's really uh, uh, and uh, uh, to me this again goes back to that uh, uh, gulag archipelago thing we were discussing that uh, you need certain percentage of people who are being very disagreeable in a democracy uh, to these kind of things um, otherwise things go to hell pretty fast yeah, yeah i uh I agree with you, but even in the West, that's a radical position because the things that you're calling for are already implemented in uh, the Western countries. So it's, uh, but, you know, it would be illegal for anyone else to do it, but for some reason it's okay for the government to do it. It's like this bloody thing that's happening with Facebook now. I'm hearing from all these people, oh, I've deleted my Facebook account, blah, da, 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 da. And it's just like about the Cambridge Analytica thing. It's just like, you fucking twats. Like, how could you only just realize that Facebook were doing the things that they said that they would do in a bloody privacy policy? 
Like, what do you think they're doing with all that data? Like, I don't want to, like, it just baffles me that people, yeah, it's, uh, it's it, I don't understand how people are still surprised by that. I mean, like, like, you know, Snowden comes out and it's just like, yeah, you know, all these things are happening, maybe we shouldn't, uh, you know, allow these things, and then people are just like, let's put our heads in the sand, it doesn't matter. And it's like the same thing, like, I use, like, wires and encrypted messenger, and then people are happy using WhatsApp, and yet they'll complain about the, uh, the Facebook thing. And then it's just like, what are you talking about? WhatsApp was kind of secure, and then they started giving all the data to Facebook, like the metadata. And it's just like, it, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it baffles me. I, uh, I don't, I don't understand it. Are they just, uh, like, on one side it could be maybe they just don't have the intelligence to deal with the complexity of a privacy argument. Uh, because privacy is a complex argument to understand. Um, and, uh, so maybe that's it. But another one is maybe they're just programmed to then think that, uh, I don't mean programmed derogatively, I mean it in terms of what the word means. Uh, which is, you know, you get memes inside you and then they program your actions, right? So then it's like, well, okay, maybe they were just programmed to uh, think that that's, you know, the trade-offs are actually good. But then it's just like, but did it, like, it, it just seems like from any idea of it, like, like, you know, if there was a fucking stalker outside of your house, you'd be fucking creeped out by that. But then for some reason, it's like the big daddy of government or the big daddy of Zuckerberg Co., or the big daddy of like Google, it's like they can fucking tyrannize you as much as you want, but as long as you get fucking YouTube and uh, you know, some Google search results, then like people are just happy to be like, here, have every single thing about me so you can develop a more adequate persona to run simulations against me. It's insane. That was, was uh, oh, an yeah, unpleasant I, rant by myself. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Sorry, so I was you're saying... uh, reading about this, but uh, I, um, it was my impression in West, they don't have kind of a national ID program in like US. Our US is a social security number. Uh, but that thing cannot like list down your phone number. Uh, your uh, bank, all the bank account information, can they really do that? I'm not sure about how it is in the United States, but in Australia to get a, and everywhere that I, yeah, in Australia to be able to get any SIM card, you need to give them your ID. And your ID is then tied to, yeah, like the, there's, you get different driver's license in different states, but it's also because the different states implement driving rules differently. But the government still knows that, okay, like, well, I guess there isn't any universal ID besides your tax file number in Australia, which is the same thing as the United States social security number, more or less. Uh, or so you get your passport, which is kind of like a document resembling it, but then you also have the tax file number. So at least in Australia, yeah, you would give your uh, ID, like your driver's license, whatever, to the, uh, you know, the, when you need to get a SIM card or whatever, your three points of ID. But it's always like the three points of ideas, like how can we know that you're you? And the government like accesses all the uh, the financial institution things. Like, you know, they know you're uh, like, I think it would be completely naive to think that the government does not have access to the telecom providers of the banks, uh, your financial uh, information in Australia. But uh, Maybe maybe that is not the case, which is why they do audits on you, and then you have to provide all the documentation. But uh, I would imagine that a competent government would certainly have those abilities, which is why cryptocurrency is interesting because it, <laughs> and not 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 Bitcoin, uh, Segwit, uh, which is BTC, but at least Bitcoin Cash, uh, the original Bitcoin. A little shout out to our Roger Ver, but. Uh, at least that one still facilitates the ideas of Satoshi talks about, which is actually developing a cryptocurrency that isn't regulated or tracked, that can be anonymous and can facilitate instant cash transfers. Because if you take away the, uh, the ability for the government to regulate and control money, then you can take away the major aspect of how the government controls people. 
and controls the nation. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. But then Bitcoin uh, BTCs, which is now Bitcoin Segwit or Bitcoin Core, then uh, so the, orig the Bitcoin that came out uh, uh, first then ended up uh, adopting techniques, to, uh, imposing an artificial constraint on it so it wouldn't scale as well to then implement off-chain solutions to then force it, which can now be regulated, um, with such as SegWit and Lightning, um, which is why now there's Bitcoin Cash as the alternative. But then there's other big uh, cryptocurrencies as well. So yeah, at least uh, that was a long one in answer to that question. But yeah, in, in Australia at least, and I would imagine most places in the West, then yeah, the government is doing these things. Um, so in Australia, it's the, the tax file number, in America, it's the social security number, but then the government has a profile on everybody, and then they just add more things to that profile. So the, uh, the little TFN makes it obvious that you don't need like the three points of ID whenever you do a new service to then be like, okay, that person is legitimately that person. If you just have one, which is the TFN or the, the uh, social security number, then uh, you can kind of be quite sure that that person is that person because it's a secret number that no one else is meant to know besides financial institutions, government entities, and things like that. But I mean, like, to get welfare in Australia, you go through Centrelink, and then Centrelink, they even ask you, like, how many times you have sex. It's, uh, it's insane, like, to be able to get some money, but... You know, it's like, well, at least it's kind of good in Australia because the welfare system tyrannizes over the people wanting welfare. So when I was like a student, I got welfare. And then, I, and then eventually I was just like, no, this is not worth the, the time, the evasion of my privacy and my liberties to be able to give you all this information. I'm not going to ever get welfare again. And I've been, you know, homeless for like six months and, and in times when I could have earned uh, tens of thousands of dollars from welfare, but I didn't go that route because I do not want to support a system that does those things. Uh, I, and I don't think that, uh, you know, like you can be fucking homeless. It's not that bad. Like, it's not a big deal. I mean, like maybe if you're in a country like America where... Uh, you don't have free healthcare. Like at least I could still uh, get the minimum of healthcare. But then again, we still pay for dentistry. Like I didn't see a dentist for like five years or something like that, or even like an optometrist. Like we still have to pay for those things. But uh, yeah, like you know, you can get out of these things. Like you just adapt and you get out. Like there's there's no need for this uh, this this daddy mummy for like pocket money for adults at the expense of your freedoms. That's, that's my thoughts. Hey, uh, <laughs> why would they ask you how many times they have sex, you have sex, like? Uh, well, because they have the, uh, the statistics of people who need welfare and people who don't. So, for instance, if you're having sex with your girlfriend and you live with her, then it signifies a de facto relationship, in which case you then do you have access to her money? Then if you have access to her money, then you may not need the welfare. And it's just like, makes sense. Get the demographic. So like in Australia, uh, there's a few reasons to get welfare. One is you're a student. One is you're disabled, like incompetent of working productively in society. And the other one is uh, you have, you're looking for work and you need something to just get you by until you get work. Those are the conditions. Actually, or if you're Aboriginal, you just get free money. Uh, so for the looking for work one, then like for those conditions, like student looking for work uh, or disabled, they want to find out whether or not this is a problem that the government needs to solve for you or whether or not you can solve it yourself. In which case, do you have access to money from somebody else? If you're having sex with someone, it signifies a de facto relationship. So therefore, uh, you're going to um, uh, probably have access to their funds. Yeah, that's what that's about. And how homeless, like, where would you sleep as a homeless guy? What would you eat? Oh, so where when I did, I, I slept in parks and graveyards. 
and I, I for food I went to uh, soup kitchens, and like I, I volunteered in a uh, donation-based uh, restaurant. So I would work there and then uh, I volunteer there and then at the end of the day, like I, you know, for the shift and I got a meal and I could also take home the leftovers. So I put, get the leftovers, put them in a little container and then, uh, you know, just use that. But I would sleep uh, in parks um, or, you know, the bush, like the natural reserve or in graveyards. Graveyards are good because no one really goes there at night time and they're quite quiet. and. You know, it's comfortable and there's shelter. Like if there's raining, then you can, there's uh, shelter, so. Cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's a whole, so there's a website uh, called the Moneyless, uh, Moneyless Manifesto. Let me pull this uh, thing up. Uh, it's... Uh, all right, Mindless Manifesto. Bop, bop, bop. This guy, Mark Boyle, Englishman, has lived without money for a few years. Uh, he wrote a book about it called The Mindless Man, uh, which was an autobiography of his first year. Mindless Manifesto is the, uh, the handbook. So you can go through everything, so find out reasons of, you know, what, what, problems money has and then ways that you can reduce your dependency on money. Land, right? What about getting land for free? Food and water. How do you get food and water for free? Home. How can you get a home for free? Right? Uh, how do you, you know, get education for free? Things like that. Um, all of these different things. <laughs> What's the health and sex? So one of these, uh, he talks about how to get toothpaste and everything. So it's uh, like, it's, it's actually fairly easy to actually live without money. Uh, but the problem with that living without money is it's all fine and dandy. But the issue is scalability. It does not scale. You're going to, if you need a water bottle, you're going to be looking through trash cans to find a water bottle and that'll probably take two hours. You're like a leech of the, the waste products of society. Um, uh, so, you know, a water bottle could be a five cent or 10 cent purchase at a market, right? That takes like, uh, 10 minutes of time or five minutes of time compared to two hours. Uh, so as soon as you understand scarcity, and it's like, of course, there's going to be issues with food, uh, like distribution of food. But these are also like, I, and then foraging is like a good way of making use of the waste products of food. So it's something like uh, I've heard 80% of the food we produce ends up in the landfill and of, no, sorry, 80% of the food we produce ends up in livestock rather than humans. Then of that remaining 20%, 80% of that ends up in a landfill. So there is issues with uh, utilization. Uh, there's a lot of Berlin startups that are trying to solve the, uh, that utilization issue, which is, you know, improve their distribution of food. Not redistribution, don't steal food from someone and then give it to somebody else. Improve the distribution so the waste is less. Um, or maybe you can grow your own food. Like, so one of the great examples he has is, if you're going to buy nettle tea, maybe you should learn to recognize the nettle plant outside the supermarket. So that way you don't have to import it all the way from India and incur the ecological cost of that import. Instead, you can just pick a bit from the plant outside the supermarket, right? But then people uh, have no idea actually now what plants even look like, like edible plants. They don't actually know what food is anymore. They just know food by is it sold in a supermarket. Like they, so there's a lot of unfortunate things like foraging uh, is a skill I think we should kind of all learn. It's the same thing on YouTube. Like there's a great channel on YouTube called Primitive Technology. And they're like, it's an Australian, funnily enough, who lives in far north Queensland. So the, the tropical outback area and uh, he makes all these videos and like how to build a shelter and everything and they're quite relaxing. Um, so yeah, like it's not a big deal. Like I don't know, it's like, like certainly like it's terrifying to consider being homeless and then, you know, you do it and you're just like, well, it's not that bad. You can make it work. So. But I mean like if you have kids and then you were homeless because you're bloody uh, psychopath partner then like stole the kids away from you and then required child support payments 
then uh, you know, being homeless fucking sucks because you can't take care of your kids and you won't be able to see them because you don't have a shelter. So like, and the other thing is you're exposed to the elements as a waste of time. Like, you know, there is bad things about it, but there's nothing like you can get out of it with your own action. And you can get out of it with free market intervention, such as that government, like the, the restaurant that I worked at, that was a free market enterprise. That wasn't a government thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, I wonder how sex would work for this moneyless guy because uh, you would use that term where women always uh, uh, marry up, right? What are the yeah. words for that? So, uh, yeah, hyper, hyper gamy. Yeah. yeah, I wonder how that would work for that guy. Well, I mean, you can always find a hippie chick. Like, it depends on uh, which game you're playing, right? Like, the, the women will uh, they marry up in the game that they're playing. So if they're a hippie, they want to marry the best hippie. If they're a gangster lady, they want to bang the best, uh, what, what do you call it? Whatever the, the I don't, what's the word for a gangster? The best gangster, right? Like it's, I, I can't remember what damn video it was. I think it was something like Live Leak or something like that. It's just like this lady and she was like attractive. Uh, she would have been like young, like maybe 20 or 18 or something. And she was doing like a bloody strip dance for a whole bunch of gangsters. And like, then like publicly screwing this guy. And it's just like in front of all these other gangster buddies. And then they were like, oh dude, you got the best girl, la da 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 da. And it's just like, what needs to happen in your life where you think that this is a good, good avenue to go? Like, what had to go wrong in your idea of taking control of your life where you think the gangster is the best dude it uh yeah i mean like it's not going to be a good daddy for your kids so, uh, uh, yeah all right uh i do you have anything else for this summit otherwise i go back to the 12 year olds <laughs> yeah we should go back otherwise <laughs> All right, uh, all right uh, Praj, you fix yourself. So, it's vital to figure out uh, what things you can change and what things you can't, and then act accordingly. You shouldn't try and remove, like, don't try and control people, because otherwise you'll be a tyrant, because you can't control people. Maybe if you had, like, that drug that is popular in South America, and apparently it's here in uh, Malaysia as well, that makes people compliant, like, you know, a date, rub, date rape drug with then people stay compliant. Um, like stay awake, uh, you know, then you can tyrannize people, but what you did was you just gave them a frontal lobotomy. Actually, there was a, uh, a clip that I saw recently. It was, um, I'm not sure whether it was by Alternative Hypotheses. I think that was it. Uh, and apparently there's a study that was done recently, which is you can remove people's prejudices by changing the structure of their brain with magnets. And apparently this is a great, great discovery for diversity. And it's just like, sure, if you believe frontal lobotomies are a good idea for the human race, fine. But then it's not like, gosh, it's insane. All right. No, this is things. what I don't like about these Western right. people, man. This is insane. So <laughs> what, what the fuck is your problem if I have got uh, uh, prejudice? What the fuck is anyone's problem with that like it's my thing it's my internal psychology yeah i i, I i'm 100 percent with you i don't understand why people are so sensitive over here you know and uh i what well, i think it's because they've been sold so much political theory that then says that exploits their compassion like i think that maybe that's what it is like to answer our previous question because then it's just like well People can be really smart and they can believe these things. So then it's just like, well, it's not an intelligence issue. It just seems to be a propaganda issue. And obviously then I guess maybe it is a propaganda issue because it's not like the Nazis or the, the, well, the Soviets, uh, the KGB were that dumb. Like, no, they were smart people. Like, like the history is like filled with insanely smart people that did outrageous things. 
uh, and as well insanely dumb people that did outrageous things, right? But it seems like, well, why did they do outrageous things? And it just seems, well, because I guess maybe their map of meaning supported doing outrageous things. And I think, uh, like, yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's great that, like, you're even concerned about, like, a government ID thing because it's just, like, trying to argue that now in Australia would be, like, impossible. Uh, and I imagine it's the same thing. Like, it still baffles me, like, in the United States, how it's just, like, the uh, Equifax hack happened where, like, a third of Americans got the social security number exposed. And then people still think this is a great idea. Like, Australia's now moving to, like, e-health, where all your medical records will be online in government service. It's just like, you fucking twats, like that's only a matter of time until they get hacked. And then everyone's medical records are up in the air for everyone. And it's just like the Apple way of like your medical records are on your phone encrypted and you control and then you approve access to other people is a lot better. But then Apple should really do it where you can only approve access to external services that treat your data with the same level of privacy that Apple would. Because otherwise you can be like, oh, I'm going to connect my Apple health to my Google health. And it's just like, then what's the, even the point of having it in Apple Health in the first place? If Google's just now going to mine your medical data, <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, you have diabetes. Let us now show you, like, run simulations on diabetes people. Uh, uh, and show you adverts and information related to diabetes. And then use all this information to further our agenda as a big, powerful Google. Yeah. I, I, maybe it's like... Uh, a propaganda situation like maybe it's like if you don't facilitate uh, freedom of dis like this is the thing like if you put government in education then you have an unfair advantage like suddenly ideas is no longer in the free market realm because now there's a government entity that says certain ideas are now sacred and it is going to be whatever that the uh, the campaigners and the lawyers and whatever helps votes to make the government get better uh, then, then want to put in like they can just indoctrinate the youth, uh, and it's like one of the funny things. Like a lot of these like great thinkers never actually had a formal education. They were pretty much self-educated. Like prove you're smart, find mentors, and pursue it, and then like the world will come to you. And it's yeah, it, like it and yeah, it uh. And it's still baffling to me, like, why people think, like, a, a indoctrination-based education is still, like, a good thing. Like, you just spend, like, like, primary school, you learn some essential skills, but you also learn a lot of shit. But high school, it's just, like, just replace that with Khan Academy. Like, I don't understand. Like, I mean, like, sure, you learn, like, some interesting social things, and the social dynamics are interesting. Like, how do people organize when they're forced in a concentration camp together? Right? Like, that's pretty interesting. Like, how do the bullies work? How do those things work? How, who do the bitches become? Who do the assholes become? Who do the jocks become? La da 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 da. Right? Like, teaches a lot about yourself and your role in society. Um, but then, uh, you should just be able to figure that out by other ways. Like, just sport. Do some sport. Do some debate. Do some other things. Like, like these are things that can be solved without the government having an unfair advantage. The reason I'm not in favor of online education, if you have the like physical and alternative where you can attend physically, is that uh, uh, you get to meet people who are uh, uh, going through that class, and uh, a subset subset of them you would be able to build a meaningful relationship with, and then build upon these things. So you would then have to find. Uh, uh, I mean, if you have got a, you need to find out some kind of social avenue where, for example, we have this group, right? Uh, where you can meet uh, uh, people who are your peers. Otherwise, so, so that's just what I think. Yeah, but uh, I, yeah, so I mean like online education, yeah, I, I agree. But then you can solve that still through physical education, like physical education does need to be dominated by the uh, government and I don't think you were saying that it does either. Yeah, I mean even in India, it's all propaganda. Not all propaganda, but uh, government decides which, which is going to be in uh, the textbooks and uh, uh, so 
uh, after I grew up, uh, I had to kind of undo a lot of uh, uh, stuff that was taught. Like, uh, it, it's it's really strange that uh, uh, we we have like uh, we don't have like a national religion or anything, but in schools like government run schools they would have prayers in the morning where everyone would be required to attend them uh, it was it was really uh, and uh, uh, and i was a kid and i just believed everything uh, and when i grew up i kind of lost trust in the whole thing uh, because uh, now when i have to read a book on like indian history uh, I don't read the one. Uh, I won't read the one written by Indian author. I uh, I would much prefer. I would much rather have. Uh, uh, you someone... racist, or should I say colorist? Now, there, there uh, was a recent Buzzfeed controversy to say because racist. You can't be racist. Never mind. I, I'll let you. You continue. Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I just don't trust. Uh, uh, I just don't trust the Indians to tell the truth about their own country. Uh, uh, it's the same thing, right? One guy visited America from France and he wrote this book on Fra uh, America. It's it's a very famous book. What is it called? I don't know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't trust, uh, for example, uh, when that rape controversy happened, it was a UK-based journalist who made this really great documentary on the whole thing. Uh, so... Uh, to trust the, you know, I mean, uh, oh, there might be people who are willing to write the truth and everything, uh, but uh, 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 there is no way for me to really know that. I just by default don't trust uh, uh, that. Uh, it could just be some propaganda drive. So uh, I, I would much rather uh, listen to people uh, who come from a different background and uh, then go through all the facts of Indian history and... Uh, 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 because if Indian writes a book about Indian history, I'm pretty sure he would be... There, there are like things you are supposed to say and then there are things you are uh, not supposed to touch. And then in between, you can write whatever the fuck you like. So uh, that's just the way it is. Cool. Yeah, that's uh, cool. All right. Uh, okay. Let's go. All right. Create a uh, yeah. So create a list of things that you can change, uh, and things you can't change. So probably things you can change well, things you can't change well. And then optimize the delegate. So if there's something you can't change, uh, or you can't change it well, then maybe you should delegate that to somebody else. And the things you can change well, then you know that's going to be the optimum thing for you to actually work on. Uh, journaling as an accounting mechanism of behavior and emotions and plans and everyday thoughts and actions. So Evernote, day one, just press record, or some apps were facilitating that. The, the point about this, though, again, we're on rule six, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world, is uh, I talked uh, before about curbing your enthusiasm. Uh, it's actually one of these things from here, which is uh, keen sense of humanity, tactness, uh, controlled enthusiasm. Uh, number 15 of how to be pleasant. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're enthusiastic about everything, like if you're high on enthusiasm, and I'm really high on enthusiasm, uh, it's like an aspect of the uh, extroversion temperament, then uh, it's really tempting to just work on everything up, like all at once. Uh, or like when something new comes up, just to work on it immediately. Uh, so you have to really... Uh, you know, one has to really learn then to, uh, you know, take stock of everything that comes up, like write it down, and then at the end of the day or at the end of the week, then figure out what was what's the most important things to work on. And maybe if you just did two of those ten tasks, then doing those two tasks would then remove the eight other tasks. But if you just immediately worked on those eight other tasks, then maybe it was solving the problem the wrong way. And now instead, at the end of the week, you have twenty or thirty uh, things to do rather than just two. Um, all right, if you don't attend to your own issues, they will escalate, and you also risk projecting them as the world's problems rather than your own. Like people who don't fix their housing finance issues, so they need government and housing welfare. 
by transgender activists who are bitter and repulsive people. So not all transgender activists, just most, it seems, who demand others date them otherwise they are transphobes. Uh, you see this in a lot of uh, funny videos. All right, if you don't sort yourself out, the world, your perspective of the world is bound by your own constraints. Uh, so you need to be able to attend to your own issues, so sort yourself out, because otherwise your perspective of the world is going to be tainted. Um, you're going to, your way you're going to interact with the world is going to be bound by the own constraints that you're finding. Like, I don't have enough time to deal with these things. I don't have enough time to be able to, you know, do the stuff that would really help. Or maybe you're not, you're even blind to the, the opportunities out there. But if you have your own situation attended to, then suddenly you can actually go with a beginner's mind or the Zen mind or whatever it's called these days to actually approach the world and then you can see possibilities that were just, you know, that were available with just a slant of a different perspective. Like, you know, rather than walking past the rock every single day and said there was a purse hidden under the rock uh, filled with jewels. Uh, that was a crime and punishment reference. Um, so yeah, if you are... Uh, and the other thing is if you don't sort yourself out and you're just trying to deal with external issues the entire time, then uh, the ones in your own life are going to progress and progress and progress and you're going to become more and more uh, destabilized and then eventually you will become unstable. And then that's going to manifest its way in the external world and it's going to take you down and then depending on how much power you have, take as many people down with you as you had power over. It's, uh, and it's so fucking funny. It's like you have Harvey Weinstein or all these other uh, people. I'm not sure what the right objective is, which is actually accurate. And then, uh, you know, whenever they do, you know, get caught out for their dodginess, then uh, they do a little statement and it's been like, yeah, I really need to go and look inside. And it's, you know, it's now evident to me that I need to work on myself. I'm going to go away and redeem myself. It's just like, you fucking slime bag. Like, well, yeah, to some extent, I can understand that, right? Because then you're saying, I need to get my own shit in order so they don't manifest itself in the external world. But then again, it's just like, was the issue due to your negligence or was it due to you just being a, uh, you know, having certain temperaments that will always keep you shitty? And sure enough, like that's for judges to figure out, and it depends on your sentence. Um, like that's the role of judges. It's like you know, but when the law is just, because if the law is unjust, then the judges just have to enforce an unjust law. Uh, but I, I think I, I, I've I've drilled the point home for these ones. All right, uh, complexes. So another interesting thing about set yourself. Set Your House in Perfect Order Before You Criticize the World. It's my favorite book, Atlas Shrugged. Uh, I was trying to figure out why the hell was it called Atlas Shrugged? Uh, so it was named after, named, the book was named by Ayn Rand's uh, husband, Frank O'Connor, and it's named after this fellow. So he's Atlas. Um, so the globe or the world was being carried on Atlas's shoulder. Which is also why when we think of Atlas, then we think of, you know, the little, uh, the globe that we can spin with our finger to then find things, the 3D globe. Uh, and because it's a, a globe suspended in air because someone is carrying it or a device is carrying it. So that is why it's called that. So what happened with Atlas was, uh, I'm not particularly sure what the story was with him. Uh, well, I read it, but it's not particularly that memorable. The things that are more interesting, though, is this Atlas personality. The Atlas personality, drawing on the myth of the giant Atlas from Greek mythology upholding the world, is someone obliged to take on adult responsibilities prematurely. They are thus liable to develop a pattern of compulsive caregiving later in life. Origins and Nature the eldest personality is typically found in a person who felt obliged during childhood to take on responsibilities extending beyond normal household, chore, household chores or looking after siblings, such as providing psychological support to parents, often in chaotic family situations, such as perhaps the Oedipal mother. The result in adult life can be personality devoid of fun. 
and feeling the weight of the world on their shoulders, depression and anxiety, as well as oversensitivity to others and an inability to assert their own needs are further identifiable char characteristics. In addition, there may also be an underlying rage against the parents for not having provided love and for exploiting the child for their own narcissistic needs. While Atlas personalities may appear to function adequately as adults, they may be pervaded with a sense of emptiness and be lacking vitality. Now, if I ever read something that summed up my personality better than that, I haven't read it yet. That is wonderful. Superman Complex. A Superman complex is an unhealthy sense of responsibility or the belief that everyone else lacks the capacity to successfully perform one or more tasks. Such a pers person may feel a constant need to save others. The expression seems to have been first being used by Dr. Frederick Wertham in his book 1954, Seduction of the Innocent, and his testimony before the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency. He claimed that children reading Superman comic books were exposed to fantasies of sadistic joy in seeing other people punish over and over again, while you yourself remain immune. Now, I can't really say that I've had that bit, but I've certainly had this bit. Uh, there's a, there's the, also the inferiority complex, uh, which is the complete opposite, where you are actually competent, but you believe you're not competent. Um, and it seems to be a self-esteem issue. But then for me, like I was like, you know, the 10 times programmer, the consultant that was paid to solve problems no one else could solve. Like I was there to always save the day and I got paid a lot of money to do that. Um, however, when my friend, uh, when circumstances in my life got out of my control and people got, you know, they got diseases that then dehabilitated them, uh, to desiring euthanasia and, uh, you know, who are now permanently unconscious, uh, I couldn't save them. And that was fucking hard. Uh, so, and that's, yeah, so that was fucking hard. So anyway, um, I can really relate to that. Uh, hero syndrome, a little bit different, but this is interesting. Uh, the hero syndrome is a phenomenon affecting people who seek heroism or recognition, usually by creating a desperate situation which they can resolve. This can include unlawful acts such as arson. The phenomenon has been noted to affect civil servants such as firefighters, nurses, police officers, and security guards. Acts linked with the hero syndrome should not be confused with acts of malice, for example. Well, why is, uh, means that there's not sufficient justification, like where's the resource to explain this? But then again, maybe this is in this article here because there is a reference. So with acts of malice, for example, a punished firefighter uh, exacting revenge or an insatiable level of excitement, as was found in a federal study of more than 75 firefighter arsonists. However, acts of the hero syndrome have been linked to previously failed heroism. The hero syndrome may also be a more general yearning of self-worth. People with hero syndrome will usually cause an accident and pretend to help. In corporate environments, the hero syndrome manifests itself with the protagonist suffering the syndrome. So with, when the protagonist suffering the syndrome creates supposed, implied, or ostensible crises, only to eventually resolve them, thereby becoming the savior of the day, the hero of the moment. The ulterior motive for these actions can sometimes be to show that the sufferer is a valuable asset to the company when there is an abundance of factual evidence to the contrary. It's kind of interesting because this is like a theme to like a lot of movies. So I like the incompetent person who then thinks, yeah, I'm going to show them. Screening. A screening method has been developed based on the case that those who commit the acts are generally young and looking for an opportunity to prove or fault their bravery. However, there is no formal scientific studies on the hero syndrome. Interesting thing about this is if we go to this discussion, I have a little uh, thing here, which is uh, not the Buddhism one, but uh, here uh, there's a little quote and it seems to be uh, uh, this last bit. We should not see those great distances of capital, of labor, and of population that, legislative, that legislative measures occasion. Displacements that reorder so uncertain and precarious the very sources of existence and thus enlarge to such an extent the responsibility of governments. 
Um, so this is about redistribution and then expansion of governments. One of the things is that it's interesting because it reminds me of hero syndrome. So for instance, let's all displace uh, a particular minority or let's go displace the Arab world because the United Nations tells us to. And now let's all save the day with our refugee and immigration programs. Um, so let's go stuff up the countries and then let's be the hero. It's, uh, I think it's quite interesting. All right, uh, so then uh, the other interesting thing is, well, I should tie up the end for these, which is, well, why is the book called Atlas Shrugged? Um, so maybe we can go Atlas Shrugged. Well, it's because, uh, you know, I think people who are quite a fan of Ayn Rand were people who were super agreeable. Uh, they were people who felt they had to save others. They felt that, you know, during the life they were put in incredible uh, needs for adult uh, ability when they were just children. So highly responsible people. People think that the world rests on their shoulders and that they are responsible for the world. And any problem with the world is their fucking fault but they want to solve it from them, which is a different from government. But then, you know, if you work for government, maybe you become horrible, right? Where the book Atlas Shrugged is fantastic because it, uh, it's about a group of people and, you know, they're really responsible, successful people. And then they're really resting with, can their actions save things? And uh, the book is eventually, uh, you shrug it off, but you got to read the book. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Could the SJW females who no longer feel significant from their boyfriends and children, so as they are people persons, they invent social problems and now feel significant. So that's the idea of hero syndrome. Maybe this is the thing we're seeing with SJWs. Maybe now that there isn't any problems, they need to invent problems to feel like heroes. And also, because, I mean, like having a bloody kid, I mean, like you're the fucking hero to that kid if you're a woman. Like the kid thinks you're the best buddy thing in the entire world and probably will like unless you did a bad job of a mother like if the kid is still 25 and thinks you're fucking amazing then you failed as a parent but the thing is is that because you know they should now think the wife is the best thing in the world but the thing is is that um like you know if you take away kids like or you know the incentive for kids then uh how do the females gain the significance like, how does the feminine archetype gain the significance? Or maybe they need to start inventing uh, social problems because the natural social problems no longer exist. Rule seven, pursue what is meaningful. No, I had something to add on the rule six. All right. Holy shit, man. You just scared the shit out of me. <laughs> what happened? Because <laughs> it's just been me, like, talking in isolation. Then like at 1.30 a.m. kind of thing for like the last 30 minutes and then suddenly your voice comes in. Holy shit, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you go, dude. I'm going to have a tea or something. Uh, so if you try to short yourself out uh, at uh, even the unsuccessful attempts, uh, like he says, set your halves in perfect order, uh, but you don't have to. Uh, all You actually have to uh, kind of obviously... I would want you to succeed and I would want myself to succeed at that. But even if you don't, uh, if you keep trying, keep trying, keep uh, trying to solve these uh, issues that you are having. Uh, because even Peterson uh, couldn't figure out his uh, dietary issues himself, like like his whole life. It was only his daughter, his daughter who figured it out. So, uh, but that kind of, uh, Ben puts you into this attitude of uh, the kind of person who likes to solve uh, maybe not like but uh, who has the uh, kind of mindset to approach problems and kind of solve them in a way so when you, when you go outside uh, right so and look at the problem of the world then uh, to me it seems you are more likely to lean on the individual side of things rather than uh, saying hey the government should uh, come in and solve all these problems for you because if you've been trying to show out your life and maybe you had only a little bit success you kind of uh, understand what that is like and you are more likely to then say uh, no we are for the individual to show himself out and we want to empower him uh, 
uh, and you know do better rather than uh, making him dependent upon more and more people so uh, so it might be that uh, by uh, trying to sh- uh, sort out your own, own house you are kind of making those neural connections uh, which will kind of more tilted towards uh, we as individuals kind of helping each other out and trying to figure these things out so uh, that is first point the second point is um, uh, this uh, i've been having this thought and uh, it's uh, uh, probably wrong because peterson talks about it all the time meaning 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 every other guys to me whenever i hear meaning i just uh, i'm like oh there you go again it has become one of those cliches uh, these days uh, even at work acha talks about meaning i mean it's <laughs> it has become this buzz word <laughs> so uh, ben i am beginning to now think that uh, you know screw meaning like maybe it is something americans invented uh, we should uh, maybe we... Yeah, we, but... should, we should get a shirt and then it says yo bro got meaning <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> right so i am beginning to think it is one of those uh, because uh, there was this one of our members is in uh, there i think uh, europe and he was saying whatever shit is happening in america it it will come it comes down to europe eventually so i am thinking you know they just made it up i mean this whole uh, if if let's say that humans have been looking for meaning uh, uh, in the kind of past over like thousands of years then it has only been an instinct then uh it's only now everyone uh, is a kind of explicitly talking about meaning hey where is my meaning where is my meaning and if they don't uh, find it they are like oh i don't have meaning uh, i feel like the west has created this kind of an expectation to have your life feel meaningful the same way you might feel i want to be like elon musk and i want to make a difference like they are making uh, Uh, so a lot of people uh, to me it's a syndrome man like uh, you are telling me hey i need meaning and i'm like you know like no fuck it maybe you don't need meaning you <laughs> uh right so so that's what i have been feeling like i right, let me try flesh this out because uh i i i think i i think i know where you're coming from uh but i think uh so So let's say if you say well you don't need meaning then it's like then saying well nihilism is okay now i think what what is happening is uh no i'm tradition. not saying you don't need meaning let me just clarify yeah maybe you do need meaning right uh maybe that is inbuilt into your uh, kind of uh, uh the way your brain is like it seeks out meaning so that way i'm not saying you don't need it uh, what, what i'm saying is this whole uh, explicit conscious search for meaning all the time like hey where is my meaning uh, what i'm saying is fuck it maybe you don't need that part because uh, uh, i don't know i mean just uh, i feel like people are talking too much about it wasting too much ta- time on it rather yeah. than uh, 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 let me put it this way uh, the sentiment i'm trying to express is something like this i was talking to this hr lady once and i told her about you know like feminism and what she thinks of it and blah 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 and uh, she was like you know what sumit and i was surprised that she would actually say that she said you know what sumit women who wants to do these things these great things they don't talk they go out there and do those things that's it uh they don't get into this whole theoretical bullshit so that's that's the sentiment i'm coming from right yeah it's uh it's kind of like the armchair philosopher right or maybe the armchair meaning person uh so it's kind of like and, and it's it's kind of like my appeal for uh children right because like if you got a kid or is it even like if you got a pet right like a pet somewhat extends to that which is well the pet is like now depends on you so you need to feed that if you then decide to blow your brains out then the if bad things are going to happen to pet but the thing is is like a pet is like well it's fairly inconsequential and it may actually be better ecologically if that you know, like this i i am in for eliminating the pet anyway 
Um, so the thing is, but then for a human, it's a lot harder to argue those things because you know if you blow your brains out uh, uh, or whatever, then it's going to be harder to justify leaving a child behind. In fact, it's one of the most untenable thoughts of uh, parents. Like you know, you, life has to be pretty fucking shit if you uh, blow your brains out when you're a father or a mother. Uh, well, mothers don't blow their brains out, they just destroy it with uh, an overdose of prescription medicine. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the issue is, yeah, so I think what it is, is before uh, the religion was such a, uh, a legitimate way of getting meaning, legitimate in the perspectives of the people and the perspective of society, like there wasn't a need for the uh, the Nietzsche's Uberman to uh, I I hope we can finally start saying Uberman without having to say the Nietzsche part. Uh, yeah, like the the need for the Uberman to then find like put the onus of meaning in the individual, uh, which is what's happened I think because now that uh, it becomes very hard to believe in a deity, then in the West then well what the hell do you what gods do you have leading your life what spirits what's the what's the game that you're playing. And now it's like, well, that game just got blown out of the water. So what's the game that is left? And then it's up to everyone to now become Ubermen to try and figure out that game. But then, uh, so I think that that's like an explanation for this modern desire, like the, the, the cultural shift now in the West for this meaning conversation. Uh, but I think that I also agree then with the notion that, yeah, like just get out there and then like start doing some things, like take some responsibility over something like, you know, like make a little garden and then work on that, clean your room or like try and help your friend through something or like, you know, tr like, you know, try and carry some burden. Uh, uh, and, and maybe that burden first starts with yourself. Maybe you don't even need to like, you know, try and help someone else. Maybe just try and help yourself get a little bit better. Um, and then that could be working. Right? Like maybe you just got to like slug it out, but and I think maybe that's what it is because, uh, you know, you have this career job uh, before, and now there's like a lot of instability as the society moves moves towards more automation, uh, which is complex people like, yeah, highly intelligent people uh, create making using the efficiency of uh, technology to then remove jobs that don't need to exist to then empower and spread innovation and the improvements of life quality to everyone. It's like federated wealth. Uh, you don't need redistribution. You just need uh, need the creation bit. But I think, uh, yes, I, I think I'm going around in circles. It, so what, what do you think? Because I, I, then I raise like uh, why I think there's a need to talk about that. Um, and why there wasn't that need earlier. And I also said, like, yeah, I agree with you that, um, you know, through action, then one can get meaning. They don't actually just have to think about it. And sometimes just thinking about it doesn't offer anything because there's no action. Maybe we as humans aren't very good with laser. Like, with what? Sorry? Uh, laser, L E I E S U R E, free time. When you leisure. don't have any... uh, leisure. Yeah. So, uh, leisure. Like, uh, I assume we spend a lot of time like gathering food, hunting, trying to stay alive. And uh, if you live in a third world country, which uh, you spend a lot of time on those things. <laughs> uh, but once you move to a certain uh, like uh, um, level at the middle class um, uh, or uh, in the first world countries where uh, I don't know where these people get all this time and energy to do this, all this uh, protest and all that, because I couldn't do it. I have a job like uh, I cannot protest on the streets. Uh, I will not be able to make my deadlines, man. So uh, what I feel like is uh, when people have free time in their hands, when they don't have shit to do, they they say, oh, fuck, where is meaning? <laughs> While the rest of us are just trying to get through the day, okay. And, so. and I, yeah, and and I think that the uh, the meaning that they get is then from the uh, thing that perpetuates the lifestyle, which is welfare. So, uh, 
uh, because and like that's the thing for me. It's like the the same reason I left Australia. Now I live one of the reasons I left, but uh, the the existential reason of why I left uh, Australia for Asia is uh, Australia is too damn comfortable. There's there's nothing to fight for. Uh, there's no call to uh, to action. Uh, so you can like sit on the couch and wither away your life in comfort and no one gives a shit. There's no need to do anything more because everyone around you is kind of doing well enough. Um, or if they're not doing well enough, then maybe it's something you can't even change. Um, but then as soon as you go to Asia, it's like every single person has is equipped with skills to help people in the Asian world. Like, there is not a problem here that can't be solved with, with more effort, I think. Like, you know, like seeing people like starving to death, seeing like, you know, government corruption or tyranny or just like trying to help people like get better educated, like improve their ability to reason about the world. Like not to change their opinion, just to improve their ability to reason. And it's like, uh, so they can figure out their own opinions better. It's like, these are things that like anyone can kind of do. It's like, you know, you can, like, I was talking to like one guy who worked with charities and building houses for indigenous people here. And then he said, well, if you build a house for them, there's no, like, they expect a house then. And there's no incentive for them to actually help and even build the house. Like you just have all these foreigners giving money to then build these houses and they don't even help build their house. And yet you have other situations where it's like, you know, you then work with them and it's like, you just kind of help. And it's just like, like, I was thinking about this. I actually wrote this in my notepad um, for, uh, let me pull it up. Uh, all right. Helping everyone starting with you play the, so I call this the Uberman mission, which is helping everyone starting with you play the best game possible leaving no willing man weak to be the most useful, responsible, and fulfilled self in Team U and consequently as part of Team World. And I think that the willing bit is the most important thing because there's only, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, not misfortune, unfortune, uh, depreciation in providing for someone unwilling because they depreciate your asset that you just gave them when if you can uh, work with people who are willing to make the life better then you appreciate like it improves it gains interest yeah all right what do you think what do you what do you reckon so i think i'm i'm getting more and more closer to um what I meant by you not needing meaning uh, uh, about this thing, like uh, you, like you're saying, in the third world, you are trying to solve all these problems and most of your energies are, are spent on that. So, uh, you know, you can't afford to be uh, this armchair philosopher that you were referring to earlier. Uh, but like when you get to this uh, comfortable life that you are talking about, like then perhaps uh, uh, when you don't have that struggle, uh, then uh, I think this uh, whole meaning business is a kind of uh, overreaction to the emotional troubles people are having. Uh, like they want to feel good all the time and they, they think meaning is the solution for that. Maybe they have uh, kind of felt it a uh, few moments uh, at various times uh, in their lives and they're like, cool, I would like uh, uh, more meaning. Uh, but but to me that's just uh, you not being comfortable with the uh, uh, this uh, full range of human experience where uh, there will be times you will be bored there will be times when you you will be feeling shitty there will be uh, times uh, where you will be uh, feeling that i'm meaningfully engaged in an activity and uh, there uh, there will be time when uh, that will not be the case to me uh, to me that's like the full range of uh, uh, kind of the experience and uh, people somehow uh, 
I think this could just be a manifestation of them avoiding uh, certain uh, natural uh, emotions that come up. Like I, I don't want any part of them. I want to have more and more meaning. And to me, that just uh, like oh, maybe you don't. Maybe uh, maybe it's okay to uh, not uh, have that meaning thing going for you. Uh, I, I think this expectation that you're supposed to be living a life of meaning. Uh, uh, I don't know, for some people it might be doing more harm than good. Yeah. I, well, because then the other aspect that you risk is uh, being the judger of humanity or the judger of other people's meaning. And that's like one of the most disastrous things I, I experienced myself, like when I was a full liberal environmentalist, uh, like, you know, the hashtag vegan type then, uh, you know, I really judged, like, uh, the meaning that other people gave. And I thought that, you know, people participating in the rat race were just doing, like, useless, busy work. And to some extent, like, there is truth to these things, right? Like, to some extent, like, there is truth in the environmentalist claims. Uh, you know, that humans are a big problem and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And we use resources incredibly inefficiently and greedily. But then the other thing is just, like... And then, you know, I would then to, to live without money and then realize, like, you know, let's test this theory. Like, let's test these ideas to the limits. So then I live without money. I was like, no, money is actually really fucking useful and it actually creates things. Like, you know, it's the same thing with fossil fuels. Like, you can be, like, as upset as you want about fossil fuels, but then fossil fuels are what enables alternative energy to happen. Right? Like, like you know, it's like a stepping stone towards sustainability. Uh, and it's like the idea that we're eventually going to reach like this pivotal point of sustainability is like, no, there's always going to be new problems to happen. I'm like, never, like, it's never going to be like a finished issue. Like there's going to be always like a new thing that we want to control because we're always going to be like the human spirit wishes to push the limits to the stars. And when we get to the damn stars, then we're going to have new problems to solve that then demand us to test the limits of our capacities. So it's like, like... Yeah, and because then it's just like, well, like, you know, the garbage man, like, you know, maybe we can automate his job, whatever it is, but right now he's doing a useful job, like, he's being useful. And it's like, like, one of these things that, like, maybe, yeah, there's some industries that are, you know, you, maybe you can pull up some data and then say it's useless and la da 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 But then, you know, maybe it's... Uh, uh, necessary for them to actually like progress and maybe like some industries are actually worse for people but it seems like like you know then you're playing like emperor you know ben uh you know emperor god or whatever it is and then deciding you know what's worth it and it's just like the amount of arrogance that is required to then say i know better is something that is completely anti-scientific like you can come up with like the best working theory and operate it but then at the end of the day, it's still like the best working theory, right? Like the, you could always be blown out of the water with something else, or at least like it seems it's better to believe that you can be like, you know, operate like, you know, develop like a set of theory or like a map of like the, the working theory of your life to then act in the life. But then like if you're constantly doubting that working theory, then uh, then you're not going to get anything done. So it's like, well, figure out what actually works and then go and do that. But then if you then think that that works and nothing else will work, then you become tyrannical. Uh, and that tyranny may actually be incredibly problematic. And like this is, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the people who, who have led horrific movements, it's like, well, or if you call something like oversimplified, and like this is Peterson's criticism of ideology, which is that it becomes so simplistic that it becomes tyrannical uh, when you have ideological possession. And, you know, if someone's possessed by an ideology, then, uh, then they're not willing to adopt a different one. Um, but then, you know, if that ideology works, fine. But then, you know, like this is, I was trying to think about this, which is, uh, you know, the way to push these rules in this book as far as possible. And uh, because, actually, I think we can, we can move on because I'm, I'm going to talk about this uh, soon because it ties in like the Nazi thing, which is the next rule, uh, which is that, 
Uh, what, what do you reckon, Summit? Do you reckon we can uh, move yeah, on to the... Just final comment. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot of thing, a lot of things we do at the work today, I think in future, they would be looked upon as uh, kind of similar to uh, what we were doing with the coal mines. Uh, because the kind of st like stuff they are doing in Silicon Valley, all kinds of experiments around uh, how to organize the work uh, place. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I don't like many things about the current modern workplaces, uh, but uh, like uh, that, that that's true. I think future will be better. Uh, uh, the the thing you were saying about uh, uh, that environment uh, moment, like. Uh, I agree with the socialism's tenets of uh, what it tries to achieve. Uh, like this American politician was saying, we want people to not worry about food, shelter and everything so that they can focus on being creative and uh, stuff and do what they want to do. And uh, I'm all for it. Uh, like, I, I, I mean, great if we can do that, but... Uh, uh, the issue, the the issue is that uh, I, I, uh, the, the, I'm all for all that good and stuff, but it real, real at home, Sumit. Real at home. <laughs> so I'm all for it, uh, but it uh, to me uh, the path they take to achieve that. Uh, uh, they are kind of not very open about it. I mean, I, I know that probably like wouldn't work. So uh, it's it's interesting how it works. Like I agree with the environment folks uh, uh, on like almost everything, just like the so socialist thing. But it's the kind of path, the kind of things they talk about to achieve that. And uh, they're not being kind of... Uh, very honest about them, right? So that's what uh, like kind of uh, pisses me off, like uh, um, uh, like not having that honest debate uh, so that we can uh, come up with the best solution to uh, make that happen. And uh, uh, to me, the solution that come up with are, like you said, ideological positions, like we should do this, it will work. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, again, uh, it doesn't uh, seem to work and it uh, kind of makes a hell lot of people miserable also at the same time so uh, yeah yeah it's uh i i agree i i had a uh, a point to to add to this but yeah it's getting late and i also realized this is called 12 rule for life rather than 12 rules for life for the uh the live stream name <laughs> so I'll fix that up. Uh, fix that up later. Uh, maybe we should do the next six rules next week, since it's getting late for both of us. Nah, we only have uh, have a few left, so I, I just want to persist uh, with this. So okay. All right. Uh, uh, so okay, because rule. We've huh? been talking for like we've been talking for a couple of hours now, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's been uh, it's been. And we got as many rules to go as we much as much we have covered. Yeah, but look how much notes we had though. Just uh, yeah, I, but I, I, yeah. I'm talking about this is because next week John will also come show up and uh, we will have more uh, how do I say diversity. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, let's end it there then. And then because uh, I know you have uh, you have to be up at a fixed time tomorrow because you yeah mm -hmm. you have a day job. So all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's uh, let's do that then, and we'll move. Uh, Move rule eight and the, uh, the the infamous Nazi discussion. Uh, uh, we so can do part one and part two. Yeah. So uh, so what? So as a teaser for for next week, it will be: Can the rules that Peterson made justify Nazism? Right? Can it justify the KGB? Can it justify the Gulags? Like, could the Nazi shoulder show, soldier operate under all these rules consistently? So that's one of the things which we uh, try to puzzle out. Um, can these rules actually prevent uh, atrocities? Uh, and then we try to figure out situations which would test them. So that, that'll be next week.
Alrighty, thanks so much uh, for joining Smith, and, and let's get some rest in. I, uh, I, do you have any closing words there, or are you just going to leave me hanging? <laughs> All right. Yeah, he's going to leave me hanging. All right, see you, everybody. Uh, join jordanbpeterson.community to be able to participate, and, uh, and hope to see you uh, join the conversations. If it was anything uh, you disagreed with, well, that's the point of these discussions uh, on Saturday. Like, flesh it out with us. And uh, and we'll figure out what is actually true. All right. See ya, everybody. <laughs>